We have one of these defining moments given to us in the gospel reading today where Jesus poses a question to his disciples, to his apostles. And um, first he asks it in a very general way. He says, what are people saying about me? Who do people say that I am? And we receive the results of the first Gallup poll. We get, you know, well, 52% say that you're John the Baptist. 25% say that you're Elijah. 15% say you're one of the prophets. And the rest are undecided. But then Jesus looks at his, his apostles, his disciples, his friends. And the question becomes a little bit more pointed. And he asked them a seven-word question. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And this, my dear friends in the Lord, is the same question that the Lord poses to each one of us. Who do you say that I am? In other words, who is Jesus? Peter answers very plainly, you are the Christ. You are, in, in Greek, uh, the Christ is the anointed one, and in Hebrew, you are the Mashiach, you are the Messiah, as we say in English. You are the anointed one of God. In Matthew's gospel, on this account, Peter goes even further. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus makes the claim himself in the gospels that he is the son of God. In fact, in John's gospel, there's a point where he'll look, he looks at his, uh, at his crowds. He says, before Abraham was, I am. Which means that Jesus himself in that moment was claiming to be God. This is very important for us to understand. Because when someone makes a claim like that, like Jesus did, that he's God, and then he asks a question like, who do you say that I am? Our options are rather limited. Because sometimes people want to make Jesus into something that he didn't claim to be. For example, you know that people like this, you know, like, they always talk like that, you know. I'm sorry, I don't mean to pick on anyone, I'm just being goofy. You know, like, uh, <laughs> I believe in Jesus, man, but he was just like a spiritual teacher. Jesus didn't claim to be a spiritual teacher. I believe in Jesus, but he was just a great teacher of morality. Jesus didn't claim to be a great teacher of morality. I believe in Jesus, but he was one among many great spiritual and religious leaders of the world. Jesus didn't claim to be one among many great spiritual and religious leaders of the world. Jesus claimed to be God. And if someone claims to be God, logically, there are only three conclusions that we can come to. This is the famous trilemma that's, of, that's proposed by famed Christian author and fiction writer C.S. Lewis. So now let's say I make the same claim that Jesus did, all right? Now if I said to you all right now, hey, I have a surprise for y'all. I'm God. Now, thank you. You could come to, you could draw only three conclusions from that statement. Only three. I challenge anyone to find me a fourth. If I say I'm God, you can only believe one of three things. And I'll give them to you in, most, in, in order of likelihood. Are you ready? One, I'm crazy. Two, I'm lying. Three, I'm telling the truth. That's it. No other option. I'm either crazy, lying, or telling the truth. That is the only thing you can believe from someone who makes a claim that they are God. So when Jesus says, who do you say that I am? question we all have to answer is, is he liar, is he lunatic, or is he Lord? Now I assume most of us are here, most of us here gathered in church are here because we have accepted Jesus as Lord, which means that we profess a faith a div uh, in the divinity of Jesus. Remember what we talked about last week, about how faith is much more than just mere 
mere intellectual assent. It's one thing to say, yeah, I believe Jesus is God. But it's another thing to say, I really trust in the fact that Jesus is God. Because if I believe that Jesus is God, this means I have to hang on every word that he says. This means that I have to bend my life and my will according to his, not the other way around. This means that I believe what he says about his church, that the gates of hell won't prevail against it. That I believe what he teaches through the apostles and their successors. This means that I believe in what the church teaches and upholds. Every word, not just the things that I agree with, not just the things that are comfortable for me. This means that I'm challenged by Jesus and I let myself be challenged when I'm tempted to look with someone upon disdain because they look or think or act differently than I do. It means that I'm challenged when my bishop asks me to be obedient to something that I don't want to be obedient to. This means that I'm challenged when the moral teachings of Jesus and his church are at complete odds and conflict with what the world teaches we should hold in value and esteem. This means that it means following Jesus when circumstances get difficult, too. Some people today are still looking for the political Messiah. It also means, by the way, that my worldview is challenged by Jesus. My political agenda is challenged by Jesus. That I'm to bend my will and my thoughts to his desires and not the other way around. At the time, people thought the Messiah was a political figure. By the way, to go back to the idea, to understand that Jesus claimed that he was God, it was not blasphemy to claim to be the Messiah. You could not be put to death for calling yourself the Messiah in, in Jewish times. But you could be put to death for calling yourself God, as Jesus was. A lot of them were expecting a king, a political, si a political Messiah, a revolutionary, but that's not what they got, not that kind of king. So this is why when Jesus says to his apostles, after, right after Peter declares him to be the Christ, he says, all right, now I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be handed over to the chief, the chief priests and the scribes and the Romans, and I'm going to be put to death. I wonder if they stopped listening at that point and didn't hear what he said next, because it's very clear. He said, and I will rise. Peter wanted the strong Jesus. He wanted the happy Jesus. He wanted the shiny Jesus. He wanted the Jesus that talked about peace and love and happiness. But the minute Jesus started talking about the cross, Peter didn't want any of that, did he? Peter began to rebuke him. And what does Jesus say? He says, shut up, Satan. It's a loose translation of the Greek. He says, get behind me, Satan. In other words, if you're Italian, get out of my face. Get away from me. Because you're not thinking as God does. You're thinking as human beings do. Jesus reminds us that following him is going to be uncomfortable sometimes. Because life in this world was uncomfortable for Jesus. But ultimately, it's the sufferings of Jesus that remind us that our sufferings never will define us. Because my brothers and sisters, here's the, the true lesson that I think we've all learned. Many of us have learned at this point. There, are, there is going to be trials, hardships and suffering in this life. It is going to happen. It is inevitable. So when we say Jesus is Lord, that means that we are following him through the trials and hardships of life. It means things that like what happened on September 11th, 20 years ago, are going to happen. We all have asked that question of people, right? Where were you? Where were you on September 11th? And if you're like me, I've been thinking about that. Uh, September 11th is always like a, it's almost like a Good Friday kind of day for me. It's very somber, and, and I'm very introspective. And I always think about where I was. And where I was, I was a missionary. I was a lay missionary that year. I was at a camp with other lay missionaries. We were in the middle of the woods uh, in, in Wisconsin, and we didn't really know. Someone announced to us that a plane had hit uh, the World Trade Center, and by the time we finished breakfast, a second plane had hit, and we gathered around a small TV with rabbit ears. Kids, ask your parents what those are, and, uh, and poor reception. 
lining up to use one pay phone, we didn't have cell phones, you know, to call our families because we were missionaries from all over the United States. And among us were people who had, who had family who were in New York. My mom was flying that day. I mean, it was, a, it was a scary day for all of us. In fact, we had one person whose brother worked in the World Trade Center. And thank God he had called in sick that morning. It was a crazy day. It was a crazy year. It was a crazy time. The world changed forever. I remember just eight short weeks from that day, I'd be standing with my, my, my friends, my, my missionary team that I was a part of, at Ground Zero, looking at the rubble that was still being cleared eight weeks later, and my eyes falling upon a kind of famous structure from that day, and that's the famous cross at Ground Zero. There, a cross that they pulled from the rubble. Now, in a building as big and massive as the World Trade Center, the idea of finding a geometric cross, right, the odds are, are, in, are, in, are in our favor. But I think finding that structure there at Ground Zero, that cross that I believe still stands at St. Peter's Church in New York City to this day, is a reminder that the cross of Christ stands strong in the middle of moments like this in our own lives. Uh, those of us who are around will remember that uh, September 11th took place on a, on a, on a Tuesday. And um, on Tuesday, or on Wednesday, traditionally is when popes address the, uh, the world. Every Wednesday, the pope addresses the world at his Angelus address. And so yesterday, as I was praying and reflecting about remembering 9-11, I looked up the Angelus address of John Paul II on that September 12th, that Wednesday. The saint says to us, yesterday was a dark day in the history of humanity, a terrible affront to human dignity. After receiving the news, I followed with intense concern the developing situation with heartfelt prayers to the Lord. How is it possible to commit acts of savage cruelty. The human art has depths from which schemes of unheard of ferocity sometimes emerge, capable of destroying in a moment the normal daily life of a people. But faith comes to our aid at these times when words seem to fail. Christ's word is the only one that can give a response to the questions which trouble our spirits. Even if the forces of darkness appear to prevail, those who believe in God know that death and evil do not have the final say. Christian hope is based on this truth. At this time, our prayerful trust draws strength from it. See, when we've answered that question, who do you say that I am? And we recognize that Jesus is Lord. And we take up our own cross and follow him. We know that in moments of trial and hardship that his word will prevail because he has conquered death and darkness. So then when events like September 11th happen, we know that there is hope in Jesus Christ because he's destroyed death. Then when moments like terrible tragedy and the sudden death too soon of someone we love happen, we know that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's going to see us, th see us through them. When things like the global pandemic that we norm we were currently experiencing happen, we know that Jesus Christ is going to lead us through these things when terrible hardships, depression, sadness, disease, all of these things plague and affect our families. We know that none of these things ever will have the final say. Why? Because of one reality. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord. And because he's Lord, we want him to be Lord of not just these difficult moments, but of every moment in our life, bending our will constantly to serve him, even when it causes us to stretch in little ways, so that when these moments of hardship come, we recognize who he is that he is who he says he is, and that we are who he says he is. We are his daughters, his sons, and he will fight 
that he will champion for us. God loves us more than we can possibly imagine. His beloved son loves. That's the beautiful of, of, of a God who's real. Our first reading was in the book of the prophet Isaiah, where he talks about the suffering servant. For years, they were trying to figure out who the suffering servant was. Jesus makes it clear. He's the suffering servant. He's God incarnate who took on all of our hardship, all of our pain, all of our trials, so that he could show us that these things don't define us, but that he does. So my brothers and sisters, as we partake of this Eucharist today, just 20 years and a day after the tragic events of September 11th, let us never forget the events of that day. Let us continue to pray for the fallen. Let's continue to pray for all of those affected. But let us also stand in the anointing of what it means to be a daughter or a son of God to recognize that events like September 11th will never shake our spirits even though buildings may crumble, even though kingdoms may fall, that Jesus Christ is the king of the one kingdom that will never end. And he calls you and me to be co-heirs to that kingdom with him. Join with him in the reign of his father that alone has no end.